I can make it happen. Actually, I'm going to just do this. Uh, okay, hold on. So I, I like to pace around, so I'm just going to hold on to it like this. Uh, maybe I won't. Okay, so, um, okay, I guess everyone can hear me. Um, man, so I just want to address one thing real quick. Um, oh my God, what's going on here? Okay, well, I guess it's not super bright. No sweat. Uh, what was that? Oh, okay, I can't tell. Okay, so basically, um, yes, my name's Henri, uh, I'm French, uh, and my, uh, sorry, my handle is Henri of Verdica, and it's something that I thought was kind of interesting, it had a good ring to it, but I didn't realize that a lot of people believed that it was my real last name. So, <laughs> I'm here to basically say it's absolutely not my real last name. And no, nah, it just felt weird. I, th I thought I was having like this uh, Obama birther movement. People are like, oh man, it's not your real last name. Oh, I'm so bummed, whatever. People kept asking me. I'm like, I'm sorry. I mean, Santa Claus. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to get that out the way, but that is my, uh, uh, that is my Twitter handle, so you can hit me up all day. Anyhow, um, yes, uh, I'm from Toronto. Uh, I do run, uh, I enjoy that quite, oft, uh, quite a lot, and uh, in fact, today's Tuesday, so if I was back in Toronto, I'd probably be running with my running club tonight. So in an ode to that, and my coach, um, she likes to do this thing, because it's actually pretty cold in here too, I want to do this, so if I could get everyone to join me in a bit of a hand clapping situation. That's what I'm talking about. So, we're gonna have some fun. Um, I'm here to talk about, uh, whoa, what's going on here? Oh, there's Kanye, there he is. I couldn't tell if he was around or not. Kanye approves. So, um, I'm also gonna do this. Uh, I'm gonna give away some uh, books later on today. Um, I'm a big fan of books, I love reading them. Um, so, if you wanna sort of take this down, you could take a screenshot of it, whatever, or a picture. Um, you wanna tweet that, Later on during lunch or something like that, I'll be giving away these books and I'll just hit you up like, yo, come check me out, I got a book for you. And obviously it's related to all this. Anyhow, let's get cracking. So, um, normally around this time, uh, this talk, I used to sh kind of show this video, but especially today since I'm a little short of time, I'm not gonna get into it. But it's basically um, a very well-known developer was being asked about like, hey man, what's going on with the web? How are things going? And then he just went into this rant like, actually, the web needs to change. And in fact, this gentleman is uh, Kyle Simpson, and a very well-known uh, JavaScript developer, and this is what he had to say. The web is primarily built, being built for, uh, by a group of people that take for granted, and you can see the rest. And uh, he went on to add something like this. Sorry, guys, I'm trying to get comfortable. All right. Um, and then, you know, he chimed in some more with something like that. Actually, no, that was me. And honestly, this is the reality. And I know someone talked about this yesterday, but this is actually um, Tim Cadillac's desk. And he's got a great 11-inch uh, MacBook Pro, or no, MacBook Air, I believe. And uh, he's got that very uh, awesome ultra-wide LG screen. Anyone has one of those? Because those are kind of sick. I'm trying to get my hands on those. But these are beautiful devices, and this is kind of like what we work on. But it's not the reality of the planet, of the world. Outside of North America, it's not that gangster. Um, yeah, and Cal Simpson added with some more details here. And this is absolutely true. Um, you know, the way we are crafting the web, there's quite a few people outside of North America in these emerging markets who are not going to get what we're doing. And in fact, um, this is part of a, um, a blog post that uh, on the Facebook um, engineering page and they talked about how they went to Africa and they were trying to get a sense of what was going on and the handsets and how they were trying to make their, web, uh, their sites faster. So um, this is a promise that they've made as well. Now, getting back to Kim, Tim Cadillac, he talked about this. I think right now it's a cultural thing, primarily. Cultural. And I actually want to talk about that as well. 
There are two things that I think are very important. And one of them is accessibility, one of them is performance as well. And with regard to the performance thing, I also believe that it's cultural. If I have to do one thing, and one thing only, I want to make sure that everyone leaves here with the idea that they need to craft the web with performance in mind. Because again, I'm going to get into some examples. Once you get into developing countries, it, is, it gets very tough. And we're going to talk about images. And images, pretty much, are the lowest hanging fruit when it comes to performance. And speaking of fruit, um, anyone from the West Indies here? Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to see no one. But I'm just have, I have to ask. Anyone, uh, everyone, anyone been, to, been to the West Indies? OK, a couple. Let me pare down. Everyone been to Jamaica? All right. So this is the, uh, a fruit from the ackee tree, the ackee fruit. And essentially, um, when not cooked properly, this is actually deadly. Um, and I've compared performance to dieting quite often. And this is pretty much a very good parallel. You mishandle images, bad things will happen. And we're going to get into that. So like I said, performance, pretty much dieting, and we'll see some parallels. So I want to welcome everyone to The Hateful Weight. Um, this, <laughs> I, I, I guess you guys hadn't seen that, right? I thought I'd posted it. But uh, I thought I was going to have some fun, you know, wordplay, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we're basically going to explore some of the challenges um, uh, that images are, are, are making, um, some of the challenges we have with, uh, with the web and images. So, Hateful Wait, this is a five-part tragedy. Man, this has got to be a bit better. Um, Act Zero, we're going to talk about how we got here. And you're going to see it's actually a lot more common than you uh, believe. Uh, we're going to get into the implications, UX, the dough, the networking that's involved. You're going to see that as well. Um, the main characters, the villains in this tragedy. And we all know who they are. Um, then we're going to get into a denouement. And finally, we're going to get into some credits, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, let's go. Um, how we got here? Man. I don't know, man. Sorry, guys. I'm so, like, not comfortable right now. Um, so it starts in a place that pretty much is here. And if anyone knows what this is, it takes you pretty much to Buffalo, New York. Uh, right outside Toronto, in fact. And someone by the name of Obama was not there. But the gentleman on the left, does anyone know who that is? That is Steve Sasson. And he basically invented this. This is, was the very first digital camera ever, about 77, 78, um, eight pounds, 0 0.01 megapixels, and uh, photos took like 23 seconds about to transfer to that cassette. Some of you guys might remember how data used to go to cassettes back in the day, back in the day. And this is pretty much how big it was. So imagine putting this in your pocket, <laughs> if you could. But it progressed about 25 years later to something like this. And now we have something like this. And if you've not seen this, this is 7 Plus with the two cameras. It gets like, God, like 60-some meg photos when you do the panoramic. And you could actually ask uh, Mr. Snook. He's somewhere around here because he brought his. Anyhow. Um, but the point is that it's become very cultural to just have your camera with you and snap all day long. And essentially, these photos are finding their way to the web. We love pictures that tell a fantastic story um, from sad moments to very scintillating ones as well. Now, anyone familiar with photo walks? Yeah, any photographers here? Yeah, so, so. Anyways, photo walks, basically, it's a group of people. They get together, and they Man, they just go on walks together and snap photos all day long. And you'll see it's very, you know, somewhat in like the 20, 25, 30 age range, kind of. And um, they're snapping photos and sharing them online. And this is uh, Sweatpants Steve, one of the leaders of this uh, community. But here, this is happening also overseas. 
And you can see right here, people, again, taking photos, same area, and with the goal of sharing them a little later. We share experiences. It is cultural, rest assured. Uh, and in fact, Facebook, 105% uh, more comments when the post is associated to a photo. Uh, anyone knows, knows what this means? Yeah, I guess so. This, this, this. Again, this is all cultural. We've become accustomed to sort of sharing our stories with photos all day long. 2012, 500 million photos were shared daily. In 2015, that was 3 billion. All right, and it's not slowing down. Um, anyone familiar with Unsplash? It's a kind of like a high-res photo stock image um, site. Uh, they're out of Montreal, actually. Um, great resource if you want to get some stuff. Anyhow, um, each month, one billion images are viewed, five and a half million photos downloaded. Um, and again, this is all about the sharing process. And since the web is a great sharing medium, we end up with heavy pages. But it's not you, it's cultural, like I said. Anyhow, let's get into some details. So 2012, the average page was 1.1 megs. Uh, today, 2016, it's 2.4. Okay sort of manageable. 2012, 50 requests, 696 kilo, uh, kilobytes of images. All right, got it. 2016, 57 requests, and we're at 1.5. So you'll see, and you can do the math, not that many more requests, but the page weight in images is up. 64% of our pages are just straight images. And so you can imagine this is going to be significant weight. Part of the issues as well is things like responsive web design happen. And no matter how you slice it, some complica complications have come about with, uh, with that as well. And one of them is retina images. Um, we all know retina images to an extent, it's about eh, three to four times the actual uh, amount of pixels that you need for, for, um, for displaying. And then you have things like this, device fragmentation. Now, this is 2015, and every little block there um, represents a device out on the planet being used. So things are pretty complicated. Um, hey, 72% of pages send the same content to mobile. Just think about that one. Raise your hand if you're trying to be part of the 28%. Uh, people doing their math in their head, they're like, what? What is he talking about? Yes, you want to win. And again, you have situations like this. Now, I like to hang out in the network panel quite often. And I don't know if you can see that, but you'll be able to see it when I, when I push the slides out. You have quite often improperly sized images. And in fact, when I was speaking to someone from Akamai and in a conversation, I was like, so what do you think is the kind of like most common issue um, in terms of like uh, image management? And he was like, pages, I mean, images are being sent down to the wrong container. Um, here's a tweet from just about a year ago. So again, imagine asking for a tall coffee and being charged for a venti. This is pretty much what's happening right now. And you can tell down there, 280 across, but they sent one that was about 1,000 across. So you basically have an immense amount of useless pixels being sent down the pipe to the client. So again, users, we don't like page weight, and we're going to deal with it. So what are the implications of this? There are some serious implications, in fact. Um, there's user experience involved. There's dough involved and network. And let's look at that. So the web is slowing down. Yeah, kind of, because think about it. The web is very rich. The applications are sank down. The websites, JS, it's like animation, it's page weight, it's, it's uh, retina images. Things are slowing down. And um, what are we really after, designers, developers? Very good or fantastic uh, user experience. And user experience is also for usability because you know when that site comes up, and you're kind of seeing stuff happening, but you're not sure what's going on. 
that's an unusable page. And part of the issue is some of the page weight that we're dealing with. Now, in some very recent stats, and this came out last week at Velocity, 53% of visitors will abandon a page when it takes three seconds or more to load. They're saying the, the, the sweet spot somewhere around two, two and a half seconds, but at three, customers are gone. Imagine that, three seconds. Um, here's another stat that was pretty interesting. Any sort of like um, blog or media site sort of practitioners here, maybe? This is important for you anyhow. Um, and then we get into some conversions even. Obviously, that's going to be important. That's where you make your money. And this is from a couple years ago. And you can see some of these stats on this website called WPO Stats, which is um, uh, a, a site that's being curated by Tim Cadlick and Tammy Everts, great uh, performance engineers. And she mentions, well, that sessions that converted had 30% fewer images. Fewer images. So let's talk about this money again. Netflix, very common. Uh, very well-known brand, saw 43% decrease in their bandwidth bill after turning on G-Zipping. G-Zipping is basically um, some compression. So imagine just turning on some G-Zipping, compressing the data, and you're almost cutting your bill in half. And I'm going back down Splash here. Any people, anyone here um, sort of host um, as well as sort of, um, I mean, host their clients themselves, potentially, yeah. Kind of, well, these are things that you want to think about as well. Now on Splash, that site I was telling you about, 2016 hosting cost in one month. The bandwidth alone was 10 grand. So again, imagine slicing that more or less in half if you could. That's what I'm talking about. But it's not enterprise only. So this is uh, Dave Newton, who's actually uh, a senior dev over at Shopify. And this is something that happened to him. And this is actually fairly common. Um, people hit their data cap, and they can't do much. And he was so angry. Well, then again, he was talking about you know some sites. But he was so angry, he took it to. Uh, to Twitter, and I told him, dude, this is so gold, this is gonna be a, a slide one day. Well, there it is. Um, and again, this is something else that Facebook um, commented about, and they realized that it's very important to optimize images to make sure that your users are not blowing caps just because they're on your site. And this is just a shot of, you know what I mean, I actually keep an eye on my data as well, even though I'm pretty like good with it. But just to let you know, the idea that you might blow that data cap is becoming more and more common, and people are using these all the time. Now, one of the challenges out there is the fact that the devs, I'm not saying they're not doing their job, but browsers realize that this is a big problem. So now we have these things called, well, these have been called browser inventions, where basically they come in and try to save the day. So this is Opera. Uh, ye of 250 million users in Europe, they have a suite of uh, apps that are there to basically um, help you with data savings. And you can see right here as a screenshot, um, again, doesn't come out super clear, but over on the left-hand side, you can see that they'll tell you what they've been saving for you in terms of data, and over on the right, you'll see some extra details, like right here and you're actually able to sort of manage the images that are coming down the pipe because they realize a lot of the times they're not coded properly or optimized properly. And that's just to show you right there. And again, how does Opera Turbo work? It shaves off images, image pixels because again, they realize the data caps are being blown through images mostly. Google Chrome, in fact, is thinking about implementing lazy loading within the browser. Because I can get into greater detail, but again, it goes back to the idea that why load an image if the user is not going to look at it? But right now, that's happening as we speak. And again, um, getting back to the idea that there's also a networking element uh, to it, the network from the 4G, 3Gs, 2Gs that are all over the planet, 
they're not always our friends. Um, this is a shot of, and this is from Facebook as well, this is a shot of connectivity across the world. Now, I don't know if you can see this well, but yellow is 4G, th blue is 3G, and 2G is red. Now, it's predominantly yellow in North America, and that's really it. And when you have 4G or 3G or 2G, it's never really like 100% 4G, 100% 3G. It's like sort of 3G-ish, -ish, kind of, two and a half, kind of, sort of, what? But these are things that you need to take uh, into consideration. Now, um, <laughs> something happened? <laughs> um, <laughs> So again, we want, they want Facebook to work for everyone, no matter the region, network condition, or mobile device. Now, these are things that you can look at yourself as well. And this is a tweet that I had from, I don't know, who knows when. But you can actually go, in, and someone talked about this yesterday. Um, you can actually go into DevTools and um, network throttle the page so that um, you can actually test this yourself. You know, you might be at home like, oh man, I got my fiber or whatever, but you go in there and you drop it down and you have a bunch of settings so you can see how the, the page will load in, um, in, uh, in a browser with limited uh, bandwidth and, of course, uh, with some latency as well. So those are some of the implications on a UX level, uh, dollar level, and also networking. But now let's take a look at the main characters. So again, 2016, 2.4 megs, that's the average site. Um, 57 requests, 1.5 megs. Of those 1.5 megs, 1% or about 1% more or less SVG. Now, by the way, this, these stats are coming from HTTP archive where they pretty much get data from like the top million sites. 1% um, are WebP. Anyone here familiar with WebP as an image format? Okay, well, when we leave, it's gonna be all hands. Um, you like that, my man? 24% um, GIF. We're gonna talk about that in a hot minute. 20% pings uh, or PNGs, and obviously 44% um, JPEG, which is JPEG, again, by far the most common format. Now, let's talk about the GIF. The most, um, well, antiquated format, we'll say for sure. Raster format, it's lossless. Um, it was a bit of a fave for a while, quite a while actually, especially because um, it had an alpha channel so you can have certain transparency. Uh, and obviously it's extremely well supported, it's been around the longest. Um, ironically, fading in popularity. And now I know a lot of people like to use animated GIFs whatnot, but quite often these animated GIFs aren't animated GIFs anymore and some of these uh, GIF sort of like purveyors and merchants, they're actually giving you um, MP4s uh, because they're realizing that, you know, quite often as a lossless format, they're too big, they get very heavy, and again, they're sort of falling out of preference anyhow. But like I said, it's antiquated, and some would actually tell you that it's actually a completely useless format. Now, everything that it does there's another format that does it better. That's just the bottom line. So my recommendation to you is no dice on the GIF. GIF, GIF, whatever you want to call it. So now let's look at the ping or the PNG, Portable Network Graphic. Now, part of what I'm doing right here, well, actually, I'll get into that after. So again, 1996, the ping came about after a little bit of a battle with the GIF and uh, became a bit of a better format. Uh, raster format, lossless, and there's some lossy compression involved. We can talk about that. Um, alpha channel, obviously the transparency, and to this day, the ping is a bit of a fave for the transparency element. Phenomenal support. Um, you can see right across, it's green. And everyone here is familiar with Can I Use, the website, yeah? So you can just plug in whatever you want to check and see what the support's like. So it's green all around. Obviously, the ping is a great format. Um, you can get some animated pings, but here's one thing you have to keep in mind. It, actually, this 
format and the, the JPEG, which I'll get into a little later, they both contain EXIF metadata. Hands up if you're familiar with that as well. Okay, hands up if you're stripping it out of the files. Okay, so let me show you something right here. This is the shot that I took while I was at Starbucks testing a site. And um, I was like, man, let me see what this metadata is saying. Well, this is what's, in fact, this is only a part of what's embedded in the picture. So you'll get, um, God, you'll get like the device name, um, you'll get obviously the size, the pic, you'll get things like geolocation, where you were, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, you can look this up, but you know, crooks have been caught just off the made it, made it, uh, the EXIF data from photos, which is actually totally wild to me. But anyhow, this is the kind of stuff that you have to strip out, because in fact, this could take up about 16 to 17% of your image alone. So if you had like a 100K image that had made a data, uh, EXIF data in it, you're talking about saving potentially 16 or 17Ks. Very important, especially if you're taking this to scale. Now, let's talk about the SVG. Now, I'm gonna race through this real quick because there's some very, very knowledgeable SVG people in the place here, and I would not feel comfortable just like skipping over details because you could definitely check with them. Yo, you know who you are. <laughs> Anyhow, the SVG, fantastic format as well. Now, even though it's only 1% of the top million sites, I think this is something that's gonna change. Um, I mean, Top million, you're talking about, you know, I mean, there's some antiquated sites in there and whatnot, but um, vector format, very important, because this is something that's gonna be like resolution independent. Um, you're also talking about, it's really good for logos, icons, some illustration. Now, as Sarah Swedan mentioned earlier, um, there's some sort of like decision making when using the SVG. If the image is way too detailed, there's a good chance that the SVG is not gonna be good for you, it's gonna come out too heavy. But again, these are things that you have to uh, sort of figure out uh, in your meetings. Now, SVG, again, fantastic support. You could look at it right here, green across the board. Um, and again, uh, in terms of sort of like uh, compression, um, does well with gzipping. Uh, SVGO is a great uh, tool as well to compress it. And I keep saying it, even, so, even though it's at 1%, it's growing in popularity. And you can tell from like conferences you go to, everyone's talking about like, oh man, I gotta put an SVG here, whatever. It's totally working. So you definitely wanna keep the SVG in mind. Now, let's get to the WebP. Um, sorry guys. Now, dating for 2010, very, very, very recent technology from Google, of course. Uh, lossy and lossless compression has an alpha channel, so you do get some transparency, and you can get some animation out of it. Now, one of the challenges, poor support at current. Um, and there aren't the most encoding tools for it. There are a couple that you could use, but I'll get into that a little later as well. But you also, with the WebP, it's like a bit of like a buzzsaw. You get like fantastic data savings. Now, I kind of want to expand on that because the WebP came out, and I was like, oh, whatever, man. And we, I'm going to talk about this, but you know, Firefox, Mozilla, they weren't really stoked about it. And they felt that the JPEG still had some room for, op for optimization, which it did. But one thing was for sure that you couldn't deny the WebP. And here's a quick example. Um, any hockey fans here? All right. Does anyone know who this is? Probably not. This is uh, Willie O'Ree, a uh, Canadian, actually. He was the first African-American in the NHL, 1957. Um, so I just took a quick screenshot, and uh, I was on my phone. And this was about like one and a half megs or so. And this is the kind of compression that took place. And I don't know if you could see this real quick, but again, you'll be able to see it in the slides. The original ping was like about six megs. Now. I went down to a lossless WebP, which was three and a half megs. N like no, uh, no size differences in terms of like dimensions. Then I went down to an 85 quality JPEG, um, and 85 quality from like Photoshop. 
that came out to 1.1 megs. But at 85, the WebP came out to 340 kilobytes. Now, we can get into the, well, you know, we have to check out quality, and the, the, the quality thing is a much different conversation, and I mean, I'm gonna talk about it at the end as well, but this, these are significant savings right here. And, you know, what ended up happening is, basically, we figured out that, yes, it's gonna have a promising future, even though you have a situation like this where you don't have a lot of support. But that's all gonna change because this happened earlier this year. Now, I'm a big Safari fan. You can boo me all you want, but I still use WebKit all day long. They actually had WebP support in beta for like a week and a half, and then they pulled it. They're like, well, you know, we're just experimenting or whatever. But this is actually very significant because this is likely coming back. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, Mozilla, Firefox, they're like, well, you know, we're really about the JPEG, et cetera, et cetera, but this happened. The same bug, they essentially reopened the bug for WebP implementation, and it looks something like that. So, basically, what's happening is this. You have the major browsers outside of, um, obviously, Chrome, who implements it, or should I say Blink Engines, which also includes Vivaldi. Is Molly here? Oh, she's not. Anyhow, um, so you're going to have, in a very near future, a lot more support for WebP. And this is something that you want to keep in mind. Even though I don't have the slide up, if you look at browser share across the planet, Chrome is somewhere around 58 or 59%. So six out of 10 people across the planet are using Chrome. Again, significant savings for your users. Now let's get to the workhorse, the JPEG. Yes. Um, we know it very well. Um, lossy, yes, lossless as well, and I can get into those details. Fantastic support. That's, again, without a doubt, that's not being um, debated. The, the most common format by far, and as well, this is, the, so this is the format that's coming out of all your cameras. So again, this is something that you wanna uh, keep in mind. Now, um, best for photographs, obviously, and again, that EXIF data, you gotta strip out. And when I say it's capable of extreme compression, so uh, without getting into the real heavy computational conversations, but um, you're able to get even more savings by doing this thing called uh, scan layer uh, optimizations, and what you thought was an optimized JPEG, there's probably still room to go. And I'm gonna have some notes about that little layer. So you're actually drawing blood from a stone, essentially. Now, the interesting part about the JPEG is that there are some variants as well that you wanna keep in mind. Uh, the JPEG 2000, which was a format unfortunately, it's um, WebKit only or Safari only or Mac supported only, but again, Losses, greater compression. Um, the same thing happened with the JPEG XR, which was again uh, another format that came out of the Microsoft camp and pretty much the same kind of details, greater compression, lo um, uh, lossless, but also uh, an alpha channel. Now what ends up happening is this. When you start to serve these images, uh, and depending on the browser, you might be able to serve, say, a JPEG 2000, if you know it's a Safari client, or a JPEG XR, if you know it's an IE client. And some of these CDNs out there are doing this as we speak. You may not know it as a user, you don't care. You just wanna make sure the image comes in as fast as possible. So, those are the main characters. Let's get into the denouement. So what does this all mean? So again, what you have is what I was trying to basically um, convey by having all these formats and laying their strengths and weaknesses is the decision making that you have, that you have to go through with your team. So when you're sitting down with your designers and your developers and you know, UX people and all in between, you can make the proper decision as to which image format is gonna be used for which picture, say. If you have an illustration, chances are you're gonna look at the idea of having like an SVG. If you have a very crisp picture, you might be like, okay, 
Maybe this is going to be a good JPEG, or maybe it's going to be a ping. Who knows? Um, so there is decision making in this whole process. So um, what I like to say is always keep performance in mind. This is super, super important. Again, the emerging markets, they're all coming in on mobile phones. And mobile phones can't handle uh, what we've been sort of like shipping out at current because, again, in America, we're very comfortable. We got the 4G, you know, LTE networks, et cetera. But we have situations like, say, in India, which is the fastest growing market as we speak. And in fact, I'll give you a quick story. I was at Velocity last week. Anyone know what Velocity is? Yeah, it's an O'Reilly conference. They talk about DevOps and, and performance. Um, ran into a gentleman who said he was having issues with images. I'm like, OK, cool, let's talk about it. Out of nowhere, they actually start to get a bunch of traffic out of India. And they're like, OK, cool. But they also realize some of the issues they were having because some of their users were constantly having problems accessing the content. So dude was just pulling his hair out, and that was actually part of the reason he was at Velocity. So you need to keep performance in mind at all times. Um, plan your image strategy. Like I said, sit down with your team, figure out what you need to do. Um, have these conversations. Maybe it's a situation where you might not use a particular image if you think it's going to give you a hard time. Um, again, be kind to your users. Understand where they're coming from. Look at your analytics. Um, see how you can improve the user experience uh, in light of their situations. Uh, optimize as much as possible. Obviously, that goes without saying. Um, maybe you want to offload some of the work. Use a CDN, depending on how big uh, your project is. And of course, use the tools at your disposal. Now, um, this is, I'm not going to say this is like super easy, but something that I do all the time, I literally live in a network panel. And, you know, Safari, Chrome, Vivaldi, uh, Opera, they all have it. And you can always take a look at what's going on at your um, image management, any site really. And, you know, something like this, you can see clearly uh, with the, it's like kind of like a waterfall chart in a sense. Um, now, I know I raced through this, so this is pretty much the end. Um, I know we were behind schedule, so I was trying to accommodate um, all as much as possible. Now, credits, resources. Um, these are some of the people that I think you should follow. Again, I'm going to put the slides up. Um, Tammy Everch, she's amazing. She's out of Vancouver. She works at Sosta. Ilya Gugork is at Google. Steve Souders. Uh, Man, the pontiff of performance, really. Then there's some other guy. Um, and a bunch of other people who I think do great work. Um, I'm actually going to give away the two, this one right here. Um, so if you're tweeting me, I'm going to get at you. But these are actually also all available. Um, that one's online. You can read for free. Designing for Performance is a great book as well. Uh, you can read that for free. Um, if you want to get really nerdy and get into some compression, there's that book on the far right, which came out just maybe a couple months ago. And I also want to talk about this book right here. Um, this actually is on its way out from uh, O'Reilly as well, but it's a joint venture with uh, Akamai, and they talk about some of the issues in much greater details when it comes to images and how to ship and how to deliver, et cetera. And I'll be giving away that book as well. Um, there's some extra readings you'll see, and that's really it. Thank you very much. Ooh. I thought you lived in Toronto. You said you live in the network tab. Fuck. Come, let's have some questions. That was funny. <laughs> uh, you might have to leave that one over there. I think oh, man, come on now. Sorry, man. Miriam took the, the wireless one. What can I say? Um, great talk. Inside a D-Actor studio. Let's In, go. Inside the dev studio with Henri and MCCS. All right. Question what? pour toi. What? what are your techniques to handle images responsibly and responsibly and responsibly? 
I mean, um, God, I didn't talk about like the picture tag or anything like that. But you know, I mean, that's something that you want to definitely keep in uh, mind and source set, etc. Um, again, I, I just do believe it's it's beyond like. I actually think that people just grab pictures from the net and just throw it in their pages. Um, and I see some head nods, so I'm not, you know, I'm not calling anyone out, but I'm just saying, you know, these are the kind of mistakes that I see. So I, I do believe it, it does take a bit more planning outside of just finding a photo you like and, and going ahead with it. Now, I, there, there are some changes taking place as we speak. Um, you know, I did talk about the picture tag real quick right now and source set tag, but um, there's something called client hits, client hints that's coming around the corner. Um, it's like a Google implementation right now. It's behind a flag, but um, they realize that it, it's gotten a little complicated, and they're doing the best to, um, you know, it's it's almost like a, a browser intervention again. You know, they just want to lessen the load for for developers. And, and all the sort of decision making they have to do. So, yeah. Uh, and lastly, do you have any uh, image CDNs that you use or like to recommend? The thing about the CDNs is they all actually have their own um, qualities. Um, there are some big ones, obviously, uh, but even some of the smaller ones, they, they tend to sort of like have their own sort of little services and whatnot. So these are conversations that you literally have to have with them, and depending on what you need. Uh, but for the most part, they're out there to help you with some of these issues, especially if you're going uh, to scale. Uh, because again, on you know a, I don't know, uh, like a small mom and pop shop, you might be able to handle this yourself. Once you're dealing with much bigger companies, I do believe like a CDN is, is, is somewhere you want to go to and, and have the conversations and see what they can do for you in terms of you know, their services and whatnot because um, they have a lot more uh, you know, under the hood than you do, essentially. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for your talk.